exciting new thing to do. Mm, everything. Okay, we are live on YouTube as well. Um, as soon as my slides load, I will be able to start. Uh, Okay, we are getting a good crowd here. I'll start uh, allowing people to talk. Of course, bear in mind that uh, standard Zoom etiquette uh, is still in place, so please don't um, don't talk over each other. Uh, <laughs> hello, Julian. Good to see you. Hello. Everyone. Okay. So while we wait, um, how about we, we have a good crowd, but not overly big. So I think it would be great if we can start with um, everyone just saying hello and um, tell us uh, where you're dialing in from. Uh, we don't need uh, long introductions, but if you want to share why did you join the sessions or where you're dialing from, that will get uh, things going. So Karsten, you are already unmuted. So how about we start with you? Hi there, I'm uh, Carsten Leonhardt and I'm from Germany and work for Define. And yeah, we are at the moment um, um, working or starting to work on a POC that is related to SSI. And so, yeah, we are very much interested to hear from Evanim about their use case. And yeah, so I'm excited to hear about how such a use case can be implemented. Awesome, wonderful, great, thank you. Um, let's go further. Uh, who's uh, down my list? Um, uh, Byte, Byte Block. Hey, uh, so this is Param here from the Byte Block. And uh, basically, I wanted to understand more on the app images. And I joined from India. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, and welcome. Uh, Mark Hennings. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Darling from Frankfurt. I work with Karsten, so it's basically the same reason we recently started working uh, on this uh, product for with an SSI use case, and we already talked to Evernim about it, and now we're eager to learn more about what offer uh, what Evernim has to offer in this uh, space exactly here. Amazing, Michelle Weber. Uh, hello from Frankfurt. And yeah, I'm also a colleague from uh, Mark and Karsten working for Define, and yeah, we are uh, about to start working with SSI and are interested in this use case. Wonderful. Alexander Kuklin. Okay, while well, Alexander is working towards unmuting himself, uh, Andreas? Anders uh, Oyama. Hello, Andres from Estonia. Hello, Andrews. Uh, Avram, uh, Sinisha. Hello, I'm dining from uh, Serbia, and I'm just uh, invest investigate about uh, self sovereign ident identity and digital identity. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Well, welcome. So, uh, Serbia and Estonia, cool. Uh, ben uh, Gelate. Okay, Ben is still not unmuting. Um, uh, Berant, Bernat, sorry. <laughs> Bernat, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm calling from Spain. I'm just uh, interested uh, how to apply SSI in the uh, public transport sector. How cool, yeah. Uh, Shirag uh, Sharama? Hi, I'm Chirag from India, and uh, I have been joining SSI in the month of uh, March with a new employer. That's why I'm, uh, you know, a little bit curious about how, how it all works. Thank you for, uh, inter uh, let me introduce myself. Wonderful. Um, uh, Daif uh, Mitran, 
and apologies for butchering your names. I'm I'm sure that it's terrible, but <laughs> it's it's a world full of interesting names. Yeah, hello, hello everyone. I'm Dave Mitran. I'm working with National Blockchain Project uh, IIT Kanpur. We are working on developing a POC for using SSI for e-governance solutions. Right, cool. Shirak Sharama? Okay, nope. Uh, Girish Shetty? Hi, my name is Girish. I'm from Germany. I'm very from Germany. Uh, I'm a student studying masters in business and engineering. I'm writing a thesis on data integrity. That's why I'm interested to learn about how this would be a secure way to use. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Julian? Hey, Marta. Uh, it's Julian here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Happy to see everyone. And Evanem, I would never miss a uh, a, a presentation by, like this. So, well, welcome. Well. Thank you for joining. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Julian is our VP of Asia Pacific for uh, Hyperledger, so a colleague of mine. Lucas, good to see you. Hi, everyone. This is Lucas calling in from Switzerland. Uh, we are Swisscom are quite active in the SSI space as well, and uh, I'm uh, excited to, to hear more about it uh, from Evernote. Wonderful. Uh, Marty Bell? Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm based in Belfast in Northern Ireland. So, um, yeah, very interested in the, the content. I, I met the Evernote guys in Phoenix just before the world went into lockdown. So, yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, that was my last uh, public event as well. Yeah. Um, um, Leon McCarthy. Yeah, I'm based in Dublin and I'm developing a POC with some colleagues in um, the citizen science space. And I'm interested in yeah. that aspect of, of, of SSI for the user um, within that web of, of an application. <clears throat> Right. Well, awesome. Welcome. Uh, Rick Cle Cleason. Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Rick Lassen, <laughs> and I'm calling in from Belgium. I'm working for Sony uh, as a uh, blockchain architect, and I'm currently working with the ARIS framework. Awesome. That's great. Um, okay. Uh, Rocky Rocky. Okay, uh, Michelle Weber. No. Okay, hi Tran. Okay, uh, Kruti uh, Senapati. Um, sorry, I didn't realize. Skudi, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, no. Uh, Martha Bennett. This is Kriti Senapati. I'm calling in from India, um, doing as a blockchain junior developer at Republic Protocol. Welcome. Welcome. That's good, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, so, Martha, uh, did you want to introduce yourself? Sorry, yes, I hadn't realized I was in you. Martha Bennett, I'm an analyst of Forrester Research and I'm following um, all these developments with great interest. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Sam? Uh, uh, hi, I, I'm, I've met James and Andy, uh, just interested on the identity space with Evan. Uh, lovely. And I also saw, saw um, Alev Dina. Hi. I am, I'm working also on blockchain and possible applications for of SSI in, in times of COVID. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, that's all everyone that joined up until now. Um, as I mentioned, this is not a traditional webinar. We do want you to be active and participate. Um, this whole event is held under antitrust policy, which means that if you are uh, speaking up, bear in mind that there might be competitors and there might be uh, people that are listening in. So if you would want to share something, share only things that you feel comfortable sharing in public. Uh, this, is, uh, this meeting is being recorded and is live on YouTube as well.
the slides and the recording will be available after the meeting. Um, Hyperledger in depth is really about being active and participating. As you could just see, this is just the start. Um, everybody's allowed to speak, uh, but let's stick to the good practices, meaning let's mute ourselves while not speaking. If you feel like there's a whole big discussion going on and you can't jump in or you just want to signal, raise, do the raise your hand thing. I'll be observing it and we'll make sure to, uh, to let you speak. Uh, you can also ask questions in the Q&A box. If you know, your mic is not working, you don't want to jump in, whatever else, use the Q&A box. And of course, feel free for side chats and everything else to use the uh, chat box. Um, and with that, um, I will hand over to our amazing presenters, um, which uh, who is Andy and James. Uh, and as soon as I, uh, sorry, I realized that I didn't do one thing. Uh, so I'll stop sharing. And now uh, Andy and um, and James, you are able to share your screens. And uh, Andy and James will walk us through the uh, solutions that Evernum built with SSI, specifically the use case of their work with IATA as well as, the, as their COVID work. It's my great pleasure. I'm a huge uh, fan of SSI. So I'm looking forward to this session as much as you do probably. So take it away. Well, Thank you very much, uh, Nasa. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I will share my slides real quick if I can find them. There we go. Excellent. Um, yeah, we don't don't have a, a ton of uh, prepared material here for you today because we do want this to be super interactive. Um, so really, I think we'll just kick off quite quickly. Andy and I will introduce ourselves. Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, the history of our involvement um, with, with Hyperledger and in, in particular the, the Aries and Indy project. Um, and then uh, we can spend as much or as little time as you'd like on a couple of uh, use case examples that, that we've got. But um, do raise hands, interject with questions and all that kind of stuff as, as we're going through, because that's, that's the point. This is really uh, intended to be very fun and interactive. Um, so uh, in terms of ourselves, uh, so I'm James Monaghan. Um, I'm head of product here at Evernim, where I've been since... Uh, September 2016, which I think is about 20 years in, in blockchain years, um, but it's been uh, it's been wild, uh, and I'm coming to you live from um, my my very green study. It is actually this colour green, although this is a fake background um, here in West London. Um, Andy, do you want to give a little intro? Yeah, thanks, James. So Andy Tobin, um, I look after Evidence Business in Europe, and I've been with the company a little bit longer than James uh, since early 2016, actually, uh, when all this was a, a crazy twinkle in our eyes. Exactly. And uh, Andy and I have the, uh, the questionable pleasure of, of knowing each other from a previous startup venture, actually, along with, uh, along with Sam, who's on the call. Thanks for joining, Sam. It's great to see you, buddy. Um, so, yeah, we go, we go way back. Um, OK, so uh, I think a lot of people, in fact, we could do a quick show of hands for this, couldn't we? Uh, from the intros, I gather there's a number of people who are aware of SSI generally, and there's quite a few folks who are, um, who are familiar with, with Hyperledger Indian areas. But I'm, I'm curious, sort of as, as an audience, as an audience goes, um, how valuable would a would a brief overview be? Do you want to do a quick quick raise of, raise of hands if you're familiar uh, enough with Hyperledger Indian areas that this would be boring for you, um, or uh, or if you'd like us to, to carry on? Um, mainly because I'm interested to see if we can do something interactive and fun like this. Um, let's see, quite a few hands going up. Well, two. That's not bad. But <laughs> that's more than one. How do we raise hands is the question. There's a, there's a button somewhere, isn't there, for raising hands? Oh, one of them's gone down. Oh, dear. All right. Well, we'll make, we'll make, we'll make this part super quick then, Andy. All right. Very good. Um, look, the, um, the, the, there's, there's two main, uh, well, actually, th three Hyperledger projects that Evanim's um, very closely involved in, and they're, they're Hyperledger Ares, Hyperledger Indy, and Hyperledger Ursa. Um, historically, they came out of a out of a common code base, um, but they've they've since evolved into three quite distinct and, and full fledged projects in their own right. Um, real quick, uh, Hyperledger Ares is a set of tools for building uh, blockchain rooted peer to peer interactions. Um, and what we what we mean by that is um, you've got some wallet infrastructure for storing keys and credentials and things like that. Um, you've got uh, a client for being able to resolve identifiers. Um, and you've got some protocol handlers for being able to exchange messages between uh, different actors in this ecosystem. And together, uh, if, if you wire those things together, what you get out of it is what we call an identity agent. And that is 
something that manifests a self-sovereign identity that could be acting on behalf of an individual, an organization, a connected device. Um, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but really Aries gives you a, a framework. So there's a set of RFCs which tell you how to build things. Um, there's also a, a plethora of code bases that implement those RFCs in a number of different languages that let you go and actually build uh, concrete implementations of identity agents to, to create all kinds of, uh, of trusted peer-to-peer -peer interactions. Um, and that's that blockchain rooted part. Um, that's where Hyperledger Indie comes in. So Hyperledger Indie is a, uh, an implementation of a public permissioned uh, distributed ledger with RBFT consensus. Um, it's built that way to solve um, a lot of the issues that, that we saw um, way back in, as Andy said, 2015-16, where um, there were concerns about the, the scalability and trustability of, of fully uh, permissionless blockchains. Um, for uh, identities, particularly pertaining to uh, trusted institutions. We wanted something that was open and auditable and had a lot of the, the valuable properties um, of, a, of a, a public distributed ledger, um, but you knew uh, more than nothing about who the individuals were that were actually writing those transactions. And so that was what led to the creation of, of the plenum uh, consensus mechanism and the, uh, the Indie blockchain that's built around it. Um, obviously, um, technology has moved on uh, quite a bit since then, so there are there are other flavors of uh, blockchains now that are used for uh, anchoring um, Hyperledger Aries type interactions, but, um, but Indy is the one that, uh, that everyone is most involved with uh, and, and the one that's used in a lot of our implementations. Um, and yeah, just, should I cover just a quick bit on the origins of Indy and Aries? Yeah, go for it, Andy. I think um, uh, it's kind of lost in the mist of time being a few years ago now, but... Um, mm. Uh, Indy um, used to be a, a sort of one set of code for doing all of the things in the stack that James has just described. Um, where did Indy come from? Well, uh, back in 2015, 2016, Evanim wrote all the code that makes uh, Indy work. Um, and we wanted that code to be open source uh, to allow anyone to use it because, you know, if it was just an Evanim thing and proprietary then we wouldn't get the global traction that we wanted for for this whole principle of self-sovereign identity so we open sourced it all um and actually when we we also set up the sovereign foundation in 2016 september 2016 when we launched it in london um as the the vehicle to create an, you know an independent uh, independently operating uh, network which is a sovereign network um and um, the Sovereign Foundation then donated this code to um, the Linux Foundation and the Hyperledger project. So that's the origin of it. And then um, that, that whole stack um, uh, of code was split into Indy for the ledger layer, as James described, uh, Aries for the agent layer and the peer-to-peer -peer interactions, um, and then Hyperledger Ursa, which is the, the open source crypto libraries. So what was previously really complex, really expensive, uh, you know, highly sophisticated cryptography was then um, available for free, essentially, with all of the infrastructure around it to enable you to uh, to run this uh, amazing capability that lets you move digital credentials around and, and do dids and that kind of thing. Um, the origin of some of the other components, like decentralized identifiers, um, Evanim wrote about 95% of that uh, decentralized identifier spec that is... Um, uh, is now elevated up to the World Wide Web Consortium. So, so that's why James and I are in the room, I guess, um, as we, we have some history in this one. Right, yeah, and what's, what's, what's wonderful about that is, you know, while, while it's true that we were, we were very early to the scene along with, along with a bunch of other collaborators, you know, now you look at both those, both those specs and these code bases and you can count tens of thousands of contributions from hundreds of different organizations. So, um, it's, you know, that I meant what I said earlier about these truly being, um, you know, fully fledged independent projects so in, in, in no way, uh, in no way is this an Evanim show, which is, which is really, really cool. Um, and, and how they fit together. I mean, I think Andy just described the relationship between the pieces, but um, just in terms of the self-sovereign identity piece and where Indian Aries fit, um, the, the simplest kind of, of interaction uh, in, in SSI is one where you would, uh, you know, an, an issuer, so some trusted entity, a, a, a passport authority, say, or a, a club offering membership, anything really, um, wants to give a credential to a holder. That's an identity owner like you or me or, or could be an organization, um, which that identity owner um, can then uh, use to prove something about themselves to a verifier. The verifier is the one who uh, 
uh, reads and, and verifies um, attributes of a, of a credential. Um, the, the way you make that work is that the, uh, the DIDs, so the identifiers of the public entities like the issuers, um, they live on, uh, on a public registry. And so we use Hyperledger Indy for that. Um, and the protocol for exchanging credentials and proofs and negotiating those connections between DIDs, um, that's where Hyperledger Aries comes in, in our case. So when you think about this kind of canonical W3C style um, verifiable credentials exchange, um, there, are, there are other protocols and other blockchains and other projects that are used to achieve these things. Um, but in, uh, in our ecosystem, um, we've chosen Hyperledger Indy for the, for the blockchain layer um, and Hyperledger Aries for the agent-to-agent -agent, uh, communication protocol. And so that's where, that's where that stuff fits in. Um, and Andy, so do you want a to... Quick, um, yeah, just a quick sort of demystifying bit as well, James, because um, um, at the heart of this, um, it's what we're doing is essentially providing an ability to move some data digitally from A to B, the issuer to the verifier via the holder, right? Digital data. That data would be the same data as you might print out on a piece of paper, like in a passport or on a bit of plastic, like a driving license. But it's being wrapped in a container, a cryptographic container with some data watermarking on it. Um, the data, when we talk about issuers and verifiers and that terminology, um, the issuers, they're, they're, no, they're, they're nothing special. They're just the same organizations that would issue you with a, <laughs> some bit of paper or some bit of plastic now. Um, but rather than printing it on a bit of paper, they're going to wrap it in the, a digital credential and, and send it to you that way. So think of it like that really, really simply. There's nothing special about issuers and verifiers. They're the same organizations that either give you bits of paper or want to see bits of paper. Um, this capability now enables the data that would be on that bit of paper to be put in a watermark digital envelope with lots of other sophisticated things under the skin that make it much better than paper. Um, so just think of it like that. When People often say, who are these issuers? Well, they're the same organizations who currently issue you with bits of paper at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I think one point on, you know, I alluded to the fact there are different, uh, different implementations and different kind of code bases for achieving the same basic construct. Um, one of the things that makes the the Indian Aries ecosystem quite special, and, and the reason that, that we've um, we've really emphasised that in our work, um, is the very strong emphasis on the uh, on the privacy of the identity owner themselves. So um, there's a lot of kind of blockchain identity projects or self sovereign identity projects um, that follow the cryptocurrency route of basically the emphasis is on. Um, public immutable records of things, um, and they have some useful properties. That means they can never be taken away. It's hard to dispute them. You know, you you can be absolutely certain um, that the person who signs a transaction um, possesses the keys that pertain to their wallet, and therefore they're probably that person. It's it's quite useful. Um, but the disadvantage of some of those approaches is it means that you're always that person, um, no matter what interaction you're trying to have, um, and no matter which credentials you're using in which context. And so. Um, it could play out a bit like having a giant super cookie that follows you everywhere, not just in your online interactions, but, but offline as well. Um, and, you know, the canonical example is, <clears throat> you know, I, I might use my driver's license to prove I'm old enough to buy alcohol um, at, a, uh, at a shop, for example. Um, if that shop were to take note of the serial number on my driver's license or to compare that with everywhere else I've ever used my driver's license and build this profile of my behavior, um, that would be considered kind of quite egregious. But we know that happens uh, online all the time and because it's made very, very easy. And so what we didn't want to do was create an identity infrastructure that made it really, really easy to dial up that level of, of quite invasive um, and kind of anti-privacy surveillance. And so um, Indian areas have a couple of really powerful um, features that, that make it useful. Um, one is that these uh, agent to agent uh, connections here that are brokered by Hyperledger Aries, um, they do not use uh, public DIDs that go on, on a blockchain there. You as an individual, um, your identifiers um, for each of your relationships only matter to you and the other party in that relationship. So they don't they go on a public ledger anywhere. Um, you can create them for free and throw them away when you're done with them. Um, and that's, um, that's really, really important. Um, and the second thing is, when you're proving things um, about a credential, um, you're not literally just shipping that same credential over to the verifier along with its uh, all of its attributes and its original signature and things like that. Um, that would be a very simple way of doing it. 
Um, but that would have the consequence of meaning that you're revealing, say, all the attributes on your driver's license. Um, and uh, because you're revealing the signature, something that uniquely identifies you everywhere you go. Um, so instead, uh, what these code bases include is a really cool way of selectively disclosing certain attributes um, from the credential that you want to prove um, and doing so in a way that uh, can be indisputably linked back to the issuer of that credential, but not to the particular credential itself. And so we do that using a bunch of the primitives that exist in Hyperledger Ursa for creating zero knowledge proofs based on these uh, on these credentials. And so that means you could prove um, just your date of birth or in fact, just the fact that you're over 21, for example, from a driver's license credential. And the verifier can know with certainty um, that that credential was really issued to you, uh, really came from the driver's license authority, um, has not been tampered with and hasn't been revoked. Um, but they're not learning anything else except that your date of birth is within a particular range because you didn't choose to reveal that. Um, and that's uh, that's quite a unique capability that there's uh, not a lot of other um, SSI projects out there that can can make all of those promises. Um, and Andy's just posted a link in the chat to this uh, safe credentials um, set of kind of principles, which uh, which we at Everdim and, and also the, the areas in Indie ecosystem, um, I think, feel very strongly about. Um, so we encourage folks to, to bear those in mind when they look at rolling out um, self-sovereign identity projects. Um, and in fact, it's a lot of that, when we get into the use cases, um, it's a lot of that that has led uh, some of our partners to choose this approach um, versus uh, some of the other solutions in the market. So yeah. and I see Rick has a question. Oh. Um, yes, a quick one regarding what you just explained. Is it correctly to say that there is no use case where you would send your entire credential to another party, even if that verifier party would like to see all the attributes? Well, you you could you could do it. Um, what we've what we've tried to make sure is that that's not the default behavior, right? Which okay. is kind of how things work today is that you're sort of always disclosing. Um, if the verifier needs, you know, if you're renting a car and they literally need all of the attributes from your driver's license, and um, because that's a legal requirement, then there's nothing that prevents you from, from sharing that. Um, but what we don't want is a situation where actually, it, in most cases, people don't need all of the attributes, they just need a subset. And so we want to encourage minimum disclosure by default. And so the protocol makes it very, very easy to, to verify to say, look, I just need your legal first and last name from any one of these 10 issuers that I trust. Um, and your agent, if you've implemented it using the, the Indian Aries projects, um, your agent will be able to go into the wallet, find credentials which satisfy that criteria, and provide a zero knowledge proof very easily to the verifier. So, okay, so even if all the attributes are required, you would still advise to use the default protocol and selectively disclose all of them instead of sending the actual uh, credential. Yeah, I, I would because you want to share the facts, either you know the claims within the credential. Um, what the verifier probably doesn't need is the the original signature or the DID that is specific to your relationship with the issuer. For example, those those kind of unique identifiers that could be used to learn more about your relationships elsewhere than you necessarily needed to to disclose in that interaction. So that would be that would be our advice. Um, but there are certainly legitimate use cases for for shipping the whole credential over. Um, but we, like I say, we, we just feel very strongly that shouldn't be the default. I, I think another much. important point actually is um, there's, there's lots of companies kind of jumping onto this digital credential uh, bandwagon, if you like, and not all digital credential solutions are the same. It's really important to, to realize that. Um, the problem is that you don't realize they're not all the same unless you're quite low down in the detail. You're looking at, is the issuer's signature shared to the verifier or not, right? So if you look at those five safe credential tests, they, they try and um, uh, give you five things to ask your supplier, right? Or, or your uh, the vendor you're working with or whoever it is. Um, to, to check that you're not going to be creating a situation that's going to cause privacy black spots and, and disasters for uh, for holders of, of data. So um, as James says, the, the thinking that's gone into how these protocols work has been based on a very high privacy um, requirement. 
uh, such as not sharing the issuer's signature, because if you share the, the signature the issuer uses when they sign a credential, and you share that everywhere you use information from that credential, all those verifiers can correlate what you're doing because they can all see the same signature. So there's a kind of um, a wall between the issuer and the verifier that says no integration needed, but also the amount of information shared that's been used to create the credential um, has been uh, limited such that the verifier can check it, but isn't given more data than they need to check it. Um, and it prevents the verifiers from colluding behind your back to piece together more information about you than you would want to share. That's a really, really great question, Rick. Thank you for that. Um, and actually, before we, I think it's, this is a, an optimum point to pause before we move into to the use case conversation. Um, if anyone else has questions about, um, you know, Indian areas and how they, how they actually help to uh, to build this kind of enabling infrastructure for for self sovereign identity, um, then then please speak up, or uh, or wait, wait, raise your hand and we'll call on you, whichever you prefer. While people are thinking, uh, I actually have a question. Why do you have two separate projects in the Aries? Uh, it used to be just ND and now it's ND Aries, and some people throw Ursa in there. Yeah, that's 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 great. Yeah. Um. So the the reason for that is, you know, in the early days when um when the whole thing just making it work end to end was was a singular undertaking, um, it made sense for that to be that to be one code base. Um, and it did it did everything right. The original Hyperledger Indie code base contains uh, both the, uh, the the plenum consensus algorithm and a concrete implementation of a distributed ledger using that, and uh, a, a cryptographic wallet for agents to use, and an agent to agent protocol for them to use. And it was opinionated about the transport layer and things like that that the protocol used, and it contained an implementation of the zero knowledge credentials and so on and so forth. Right. So it was it was an opinionated implementation of a um, identity meta system, if you will. Um, and what's been great is as the community has um, picked this up and got involved, there have been really fantastic contributions about well, actually. Um, we could use uh, different ledgers that have different properties, like Indie suits some projects really well. Um, other people would prefer something permissionless, like uh, like the Ion project from, from Microsoft, for example, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Other people are very interested in different flavors of agents that, uh, that aren't about uh, individuals having wallets on mobile phones, for example, but might be uh, more about connected devices or so forth. And so there's a whole separate um, flavor of work around the, the agents themselves. Um, and then finally, a lot of the uh, cryptographic primitives that were created to enable these zero knowledge uh, proofs, they're based on on 20 year old uh, 20 year old work, but they were um, some of the first like practical implementations of those things. Um, and they were useful in other types of projects aside from um, specifically identity projects. And so what that led to was essentially these those three separate components, the, the ledger, um, the agent to agent protocol um, and the, the underlying crypto primitives, um, each becoming full fed, full fledged projects in their own right, um, because they, they each have a separate community around them. And so they fit together really, really nicely when you're building SSI things, um, but they're quite pluggable and, and useful elsewhere uh, in, in their own right. Cool. Any, I see, uh, Marty, you've come off mute. Did you have a question? Oh, no, I was just getting set up, but I mean, no, I think that all makes sense because the last time I seen it, I was a bit not confused. I, I, I remember Aries coming out of India, and I was it was Aries. Yeah, it was Aries. I was trying to or Arsenal was trying to get my head around, but no, that that was a good explanation. That right. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> and typically, you won't do much with Indy um, if you're going to implement a deployment um, of some of the the sorts you'll see in a second. You'll yeah. be typically interacting with Aries from a, you know, a mobile app perspective or an enterprise integration perspective. Um, Ursa lurks under the skin there, you know, um, if you're a real crypto geek, you know, dive in, have a look, it's pretty amazing. Um, and Indy is used at the bottom layer for the, um, uh, the ledger infrastructure. So most interactions will happen with, uh, with Aries. Yeah. But what, what's great is that there's, you know, there's, <clears throat> for people looking to get involved in, in open source though, there's, there's projects that can scratch all these, all these different itches, right? So if you're, um, I don't go back here. If, if you're into um, consensus algorithms and things like that, state proofs, um, you know, Indy's a fascinating project uh, to, to get involved with. Um, you know, at the application layer, there are RFCs in Aries for doing 
all kinds of things that are not just related to um, exchanging credentials back and forth. You know, people have, have looked at what a chat protocol might look like, um, what digital receipts might look like for purchases, this, uh, what payments might look like over Aries, all these kinds of things. Um, so all the different layers of the stack, um, which would be uh, which would be really great. So for folks who are looking to get involved, um, there's there's different projects that, that suit different uh, predilections there as well. Okay, well, shall we move on to a use case example that might that might tease out some more questions? Or does, does anyone else, I'm just trying to see if no, no one else has come off mute. So um, any other questions or we'll, we'll move on? Okay. Uh, Rick, do you yeah. have a question? <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah, perhaps one quick to better understand your examples. Yeah. I assume that in your examples, you are going to present uh, uh, agents, identity agents. So probably some of them will be mobile. Yes. Okay, now my question. Um, because in uh, the Aris framework, we, for the majority, I think, is using the uh, Akapai cloud agent, mm -hmm. which has implemented all the uh, protocols. Now, on a mobile uh, application, um, I think there is only the .NET implementation. Mm -hmm. um, so is it okay that we say we build mobile agents by only making a mobile UI and the actual agent is the Akapai cloud agent. So both work in tandem, like the mobile application, which serves as a front end UI yeah. together with the RS blockchain uh, uh, cloud agent. Uh, so that's such a good question, Rick, um, because yeah, that, that, is, uh, that is a point of, of you know, quite active debate uh, honestly, you know, there's uh, having a uh, having a cloud agent where the mobile UI is essentially a, a remote control for it um, is uh, offers a number of practical benefits. Um, you know, it's easy to build scalable cloud infrastructure. Um, there are well established patterns for how you secure that and things like that. And so it's it's um, it's a very practical way to get started. Um, and likewise, a thin client on mobile, um, you know, the, the development talent for that is widely available. Um, it's, it's an incredibly pragmatic way to get started. Um, and so that is the path that a lot of people have chosen. Um, it, it introduces some challenges though that are not unlike the trade-offs of the legacy identity world, which you know, self-sovereign identity tries to get away from, which is that it makes you place a lot of trust in whoever is running that cloud agent for you, because at the end of the day, um, you don't actually control those keys and those credentials. You are, you have an app that issues some instructions to a piece of software that runs on someone else's machine, and you hope that it does what what you ask it to. Um, and uh, that is, you know, you you could make the case that that is not that different to using a federated identity provider like a sign in with uh, sign in with Google or Microsoft Azure Active Directory or something like that. Um, you know, where where truly you are, you're still a client of the system. You're not you're not actually manifesting much agency. Um, there are uh, concrete um, edge agent implementations that um, that run on mobile, um, and actually, you know, so at, at Evanim, our Connect.me mobile app um, and the the mobile SDK that we give to uh, to our customers who want to build their own apps um, is a full fledged uh, edge agent, so that the keys and the wallet. Uh, and the credentials themselves um, all live uh, on the mobile device um, itself. And um, the there is a cloud component, but it's really just an Aries mediator that is used to relay messages back and forth, encrypted messages that it, it can't uh, it can't read. Um, that that approach is um, it, to, to make it work well on mobile. Um, you know, I used this phrase opinionated earlier. Um, you know, it had to make some Im implementation choices um, to to make it actually. Uh, work reliably on on iOS and Android, um, and so there is uh, there is an open source implementation of that. It's um, it's the original um, uh, agent to agent protocol that was part of that code base. Uh, Andy mentioned it uh, in in the kind of the little history lesson there. Um, it's called called VCX, which is Evanim's Verifiable Credential Exchange um, Library, and so that that is open source um, as uh, and comes with builds for for iOS and Android. Um, the the Aries community itself. Um, is, is not a big fan of the approach that, that we took at Evanim. So while that, that project is open source, um, it's not actually part of the, the Aries code base. And so it's made available as, as Evanim open source instead. 
um, you know, so that's um, that, that's where that exists, you know, and, and this is the this is the beauty of uh, community governed open source is that you know there's a there's a lively debate about the right way to do things, um, and you know we we welcome that frankly. So we we don't get to say uh, hey look we did loads of work we're gonna we're gonna put this in your project and you're gonna take it. Um, you know there's there's a conversation about whether it's uh, it's consistent with uh, the direction that that project wants to go. Um, so it is worth saying the. Um... Uh, the Evnim Connect Me app and the SDK that it's built on uh, is Aries compatible though, James, isn't it? And actually that um, we are open sourcing um, all of our proprietary software right now. So our, our Verity Enterprise Credential Exchange platform uh, has been open sourced already. Um, you can go and have a look at it. Um, the um, uh, mobile SDK and the app side of it is being open sourced as we speak as well. Um, so that does have, you know, our focus is on you know, privacy um, by design at the, the best it can possibly be because it's always difficult to add it in later. So get it right from the start. Um, and part of that is having an edge agent uh, that is fully capable, fully featured, is a full wallet with uh, the ability to create peer dids on the fly um, and hold credentials and create proofs with all the crypto in it. So that's what connect.me is um, and the code underneath it um, with Aries compatibility is is very capable as well. Um, yeah, and, and we can probably show how it's, how it's used, can't we? Exactly, and it, and it does. Uh, so I think the point is that it works and it's passed um, it's passed the interoperability tests with uh, other Aries compatible wallets like Akapai, for example. So you can use Akapai to issue credentials into uh, into our Edge wallet, connect.me. Um, and likewise, connect.me can prove to, to Akapai verifiers and things like that. And so, you know, think of Aries as both the body of RFCs, which is kind of the standards that everybody wants to use for these protocols, um, and a handful of concrete implementations of those, um, of, of those protocols. Does that make sense, Rick? Yeah, well, let's crack on. We have only yes, 15 definitely. minutes Thank left. You. So uh, oh. I really want to learn about the use cases. Yeah, okay. we're get on to the good stuff. All right, let's, let's do that then. All right. Oh gosh, look at that header. So, um, yeah, I'll do this. I'll do this fairly quickly then, because the most interesting part is going to be the discussion. Um, but uh, and also probably some of you have um, have read about this uh, this anyway, um, because you can't open a newspaper these days without a conversation about um, health passports, immunity passports. I think everyone is looking forward to the summer, wants to go travelling again, um, these kinds of things. Um, so it's a very it's a very hot topic. Um, and as far as the airline industry is concerned, this is why they, they saw a $300 billion revenue shortfall last year um, because no one is traveling. Um, and that is devastating, uh, not just for the airline industry, but also for all the economies that, um, that travel both for leisure and business supports. Um, and you know, what people are proposing as a solution, and I say people, this is not technologists, this is public health experts and, and sovereign governments and things like that are proposing that um, a, a reasonable risk adjusted way to reopen travel might be to have you prove that you've had a recent negative COVID test in addition to proving that you have uh, a legal travel document. Um, there's a lot more nuance to it and a lot of policy debate around it, which I, I don't think um, I don't think is, is, is our place to weigh in on, frankly, but, but this, is what, uh, this is what a number of governments and, uh, and trade bodies have decided is, is the way they want to solve the problem. Um, and so seeing that, uh, we think, gosh, well, th there's, there's a number of damaging and harmful ways you could do that from a privacy perspective, or there's, there's some quite, uh, quite elegant ways you could do it. Um, so working with IATA, um, what we have uh, come up with is an industry solution for this. So IATA has, has conceived of uh, a solution they're calling a Travel Pass, which is a framework for um, verifying your passport at home going and getting a, uh, a COVID test that meets the entry requirements for the country you're traveling to and having the result of that COVID test um, also stored on your phone and then being able to share with your airline, um, but also with the immigration authorities and airport staff and so forth, um, the required proof that A, you're allowed to travel um, for, from your passport, you have a valid boarding pass and you have a, a negative COVID test um, and doing all that with uh, with the privacy properties that, that we were just discussing. Um, and so. That sounds fairly simple. Um, obviously, uh, you could hand a, an opportunity like that to a, a large tech vendor and they build you a big database, right? They say, oh, no problem. Hundreds of airlines, thousands of airports, a uh, few hundred passport issuers, easy peasy, let's get Oracle on the case. Um, and you know that, that works to a certain extent until you have to answer the question of, well, who runs that database and who pays for it 
who decides who connects into it um, and what do you do about the fact that if this has to be global um, there is no one sort of global standard for handling the data governance and privacy concerns and, and very quickly you end up in a place where you realize um, you know IATA as a trade body are very well positioned to uh, to advocate for a common standard for how you do this um, but it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for them to build a, a centralized system with a master record of every traveler in the world's uh, health status that would be prohibitively expensive and frankly uh, quite a bad thing. Um, now there's a, a, as Andy posted a link to in the chat, uh, there was a whole kind of 90 minute webinar we did that, that goes into detail on this with uh, with the team from IATA actually you'll be able to find a link to that on our website. Um, but at a high level, um, the, the way the solution looks is, is like this. So armed with uh, privacy enhancing verifiable credentials and the Hyperledger Aries and Indies, uh, Indie project, um, you can see how actually, if I verify my passport, um, I could model that as a credential. Um, same thing, I can equip testing labs to be able to verify the passport when I show up, make sure I'm really me, and then issue a COVID test result to me um, uh, as a result of, of processing my sample. And then armed with my wallet, uh, both to do online check-in and then as I move through the airport uh, and arrive at my destination, I'm able to prove uh, only the attributes that are required from those two credentials to show that I am I'm safe and able to travel. And so um, this looks, if you were to sort of fold this, fold this down by 45 degrees, this would show you that classic trust triangle that almost every uh, ver verifiable credentials use case ends up coming down to. Um, it ends up and it's really quite simple. Um, but what's powerful about it is the scale that um, building it on these open frameworks enables because um, not everybody has to use the IATA app as long as they use the standards that IATA promotes, then airlines can embed this uh, in their own mobile app and build their own solution. Um, not every testing lab uh, needs to get uh, you know, a solution from Evanim or, or even from IATA as long as they're following the governance process associated with, it, with issuing a compatible credential and as long as they're using the Hyperledger Aries protocols, then, um, then they're good to go. And similarly, we're not asking every airline, airport, and immigration authority in the world to plug into one big centralized system that would be awful from a scalability perspective. You know, we want to get back to 4 billion travelers a year. Um, and so uh, instead, they can all choose uh, solutions that meet these requirements from the vendors of their choice um, and, and go and implement something. And together, we build a vibrant global ecosystem that starts off with airline travel, but can easily expand into uh, not just other forms of travel, but a number of other sort of high occupancy scenarios where people are very worried about the, uh, the implications of, um, of, of admitting people that have unknown health status. And so um, in, a, in a nutshell, that is the, the use case. Um, and that's specifically why uh, Hyperledger Aries and, and Indy um, enable us to, to address it. Um, I see loads of chat messages flowing through while I was, while I was talking there. So this, this looks like a good topic for me pausing uh, for discussion on this. There's one about uh, the, the perennial question of what if I lose my phone, James? Yeah, do you want to take that, Andy? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, so lots of options, actually, here if you lose your phone. Firstly, um, you, know, you can have your, uh, well, you, normally your phone will be backed up and um, you can elect to have contents of various apps backed up. Um, so the, the, the first port of call here with the what if I lose my phone question? And we have got a really good um, blog article on this, which we'll have to dig up actually, um, uh, is that what would happen if you lost your paper credentials, right? So if you lose your paper credentials, what do you do? Well, you've got to go and get a new set reissued. You can't back them up and recover them. So backup and recovery is the first kind of uh, port of call there. And then you're into other questions about things like um, the ability to revoke your wallet's ability to do anything. Um, the ability for issuers to revoke credentials that they previously issued, um, and also um, uh, the ability of, of you yourself to, you know, the worst case scenario, right? You've lost everything, you've got no backup, etc. That worst, worst case scenario is the same as the, the best case with paper documents, which is you, you go start again and you, you get them reissued again. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to having digital credentials in a digital wallet and they, they, they can be backed up and restored. And this is probably a, a new business opportunity for maybe organizations like banks who you trust to hold your monetary credentials, i.e. your money in a bank account, 
um, well, maybe they could be a custodian for backups uh, as well and releasing them only when they know that um, the person they're releasing to them to is the right person. So yeah. um, lots of options on that. And I'll find the, the link to the What If I Lose My Phone blog post for you in a minute. Perfect. And, and I think it's important also, Andy, to stress that um, you know, this, is, this is not going to be mandatory for travellers at all. Um, and so... Yeah. Um, you know, we're not forcing you to have a smartphone uh, and to, to download some app that you might not be sure about. You know, the, the paper-based process um, will still need to exist and, and will for some time. Um, but this, this is going to be offered uh, to travelers who, uh, who will see the benefits in it. And I think certainly a lot of, a lot of frequent travelers um, definitely will. Um, right, Mark, uh, Mark has his hand up. Um, you, uh, what would you like to say, Mark? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I like this picture. It's it's very clear. But what I'm missing is uh, who uh, who offers credentials to the testing lab? I mean, at some point, the airport or airline will have to deal with thousands of testing labs worldwide, and they cannot travel to each of them and check if that's actually legit, right? So yeah. there must be some government or someone who issues credentials to the testing lab, such that I know that I can trust that lab. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the there's a the, the short answer and the slightly longer answer. So the, the short answer is that. Um, one of the services IATA provides to the airline industry is they run this uh, this product called Tomatic, which um, knows about all the entry requirements for um, every every route um, in the skies, basically. So if you're a citizen of country A with a passport from country uh, B with a visa of type C and you're traveling to destination D via E, et cetera, it can figure out um, whether or not you can get on the plane um, and, and what, what requirements you need, to, you need to meet. And so that's used at check-in and all kinds of things to try and make sure that airlines are not boarding passengers um, who will be turned away at their destination. Um, and so IATA is extending the capabilities of that to bring in um, government's uh, own requirements about what type of test is going to be permitted for, uh, for entry. So the first thing is to capture Okay, um, you know, we require PCR tests 72 hours before before flights, or you know, we need a, la a rapid flow test that happens in the departure port, or, you know, whatever it happens to be. And um, they're capturing all those requirements, um, and then they're working um, with uh, the airlines themselves, who have been very busy in the last several months, um, signing partnerships with labs in the countries that they operate to provide these types of services. And IATA is onboarding them all into a registry, and it's a simple trust registry that says, okay, um, these these labs. Uh, which meet the requirements of these airlines, which are guided by these government requirements. Um, they, when they issue credentials, they will do it using using this these DIDs, right? So there's a DID for for each lab. And so um, on the verify side, you're able to know with certainty which lab it was that issued the credential, and then um, you can you can figure out if they uh, if they are trusted or not um, by using the IATA trust registry. But IATA doesn't want to be the sole authority of you know, what is and isn't a legit testing lab, because as you said, number one, that'd be hard to scale. And number two, um, that's not really their job. Their job is, is airline travel, not, um, not uh, clinical testing. Um, and so the way they're doing it is, in con is consistent with the kind of trust over IP foundation framework for how, how governance frameworks work. Um, and uh, Andy can stick a link maybe to that in the, in the chat if he's got a sec. But, um, you know, trust over IP talks about how you can layer in both the cryptographic trust, which is this credential came from this DID and, and was shown to me by this holder, with the um, the kind of real governance trust of, and I know who stands behind that DID, and I know what circumstances under which that credential was issued, so I can infer some level of trust from it. I can make some decisions, and there's a whole stack that sort of sits next to the technical stack, which is the governance stack, um, and the trust over IP. Um, principles show you how to um, how to build that framework up from the DID level through the credential exchange level to the wallet level and, and, and so on and so forth. And so um, IATA and a number of industry participants in the um, Good Health Pass Foundation, things like that, are working together on publishing what that government's framework looks like, because the goal is for it to be uh, an open collaborative um, movement that, that no one organization like, like IATA needs to run. Um, thank you, but this, this registry, this trust registry, that sounds like something highly decentralized then, right? Correct. It's, it's a locus of centralization for this particular use case, because what everybody here has in common is they want to know that um, they want to know that someone they trust issued that credential. And so in the beginning, 
IATA is acting as, as a proxy for that. They're saying, well, look, we, we have some expertise, um, not really in the technology level, we have some expertise in figuring out what the requirements are um, for people to travel. And so they're parlaying that expertise into bootstrapping this use case. But their long-term ambition is not to be the sole arbiter of um, which testing labs um, are, are compliant with which country's entry requirements. They, they want to put this sort of thing in place, but by doing it using trust over IP principles, um, other registries, which could be country specific or could be run by other bodies, um, they can emerge um, and IATA will be in a position to be able to, to step back and not have to run that in a centralized way. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a question from uh, Marty James, and we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I yeah. can go another 15 if I, you. I, I can try and be a bit quick, so I, I have to drop off. I have another call about to start. Um, you see, just on the whole, losing my phone, does does that mean, does the, the device play a part in the verification between issuer and verifier, or or is it is it really just a wallet? What I'm trying to think of is, if I issued a credential to device A, and suddenly it was being asked to be verified from device B, that would raise a red flag for some people. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, and so... There are different approaches to supporting, you know, multiple devices that have control of the same wallet. Um, and I think it's safe to say that there's no, um, at the moment, there's no one approach that the whole community um, has agreed on. Um, you know, in, in the case of a cloud wallet, obviously it's very easy because your wallet lives in the cloud and all your devices are basically just remote controls for that. So it would be, it would be seamless to the verify mm -hmm. which device you're using, they wouldn't even know. Um, that's very good for a user's perspective, but as you said, in some applications that might raise a raise an eyebrow from a trust perspective. Um, in Evanim's products, um, we, we've chosen to avoid that particular brand of confusion. So we've said, well, for now, um, we want everyone to have a primary device um, and, a, and a primary wallet associated with it. Um, and we, we accept that that might uh, preclude us from playing in some use cases. But what it means is you've got a very strong answer to that question, because basically it's either your primary device um, or it's not you. Um, yeah, so that way you have a very strong guarantee. Great. Well, th thanks very much for that. Listen, I have to go, but look, that's been really, really good. Um, thanks. Thanks for the time, guys. Okay, and sure. uh, if, if everyone has time, I'm happy to continue. Uh, if there are more questions that you'd like to ask, I think it's more uh, valuable than, than finishing, but I understand if people need to run. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I see Paul asking if uh, delegated trust for the DIDs allow recovery or revalidation uh, path for the wallet. Yeah, I mean, recovery is um, a really important point, actually. Uh, you need to make sure that the right person is recovering the right thing um, if, in the case of loss. Uh, there's quite a few different approaches, everything from you know, social key sharding uh, to you know, a, a kind of... Um, guardian-like approach, like having a bank look after your backups. There's lots of different approaches and they'll differ depending on uh, on different use cases. Um, so uh, I think the answer to that, Paul, is, is yes, that approach could work. Um, Aaron says, how can I stop my credentials from being shared by airports or airlines to others without your permission? Okay, that is a good one. Um, so when you provide a proof, um, that proof is provided down a singular unique channel you have with the verifier. Um, that proof is, uh, is not usable down any other channel you've, you've got. It's, it's particular to that request that the verifier has made and it's down that pairwise connection, that, that unique link you have with that particular verifier. Of course, if you're providing some data like my name is Andy, um, that's wrapped up in a nice secure um, watermark cryptographic envelope, right? The verifier gets that, unwraps it, unwraps it, checks it, verifies it, and then it says Andy, and um, this, the fact that I am Andy was issued by the passport office. So that's great. They now have a bit of data that says Andy on it. They can then do something else with that if they wanted to. If they wanted to send that piece of data somewhere else, it's just like any other piece of data. So you can't you know, there's no sort of ability to suck back from the ether. <laughs> um, yeah. But what you do have is you have proof that you've shared it. Um, they have proof they received it. And if you want to then resort to law and GDPR, for example, if you suspect someone has shared your data without your consent, you have a really powerful tool to prove what you shared and when you shared it and for what purpose uh, that comes out of the box uh, with, with the technology. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question in the in the Q and A as well. Um, so this says, uh, "What will be the disadvantages if we use certificate authorities and centralized repositories instead of DIDs and blockchains? 
to create verifiable credentials, as the ecosystem still has to trust the stewards during onboarding of issuers, et cetera. And then there's a, a sub question, which is what are the incentives for stewards? So it's a, a two-parter. So disadvantages of, of using centralized repositories instead of blockchain-based DIDs. Yeah, um, and it's no, it, it's no um, accident that some of the biggest certificate authorities in the world are involved in, <laughs> uh, uh, in this whole uh, space, looking at how you know, their processes for onboarding businesses, for example, to issue them with certificates can be converted into verifiable credentials as well. Um, so there's a lot of interest from the certificate authority space, um, which you could see as being um, them being positive, looking at new opportunities and also being defensive as well. Um, the difference here is the, um, I don't need a certificate authority to set up a digital relationship with another party in this, this new world. I can just set it up. So if I need a digital relationship with James to share some information, I can set that up independently of anyone else. Okay. And we can then share data down the secure link. And that's a huge, uh, capability that you know, it's hugely important it's not really existed before we've always had to rely on somebody else now with the um, protocols in Aries for free anybody can create a software stack that allows two parties to create uh, by themselves a secure digital connection and share information across it and that's that's massive that can be used for so many things Whereas previously you'd have to rely on a CA to give you a certificate that you can then use and then has to go back to the CA to be checked. So it, it's a way. I think I think a way to boil that down, Andy, is to tell me if you think I'm I'm doing a, doing your statement justice. It, it kind of pulls apart the roles of, um, of of vouching for the issue of a credential, right? So the certificate authority does two things. They say the person with this ID really is this person um, or this company, um, and then they run a big database of those things and let people access to it. Um, and what using a decentralized PKI like uh, like an indie ledger lets you do is pull those roles apart and say, well, um, anyone who is qualified um, can stand up and say this this actor is this entity, um, and it's up to you whether you trust them or not. Um, but you don't also have to trust uh, any one centralized entity to run the list of of all those things. Um, that can be run in a cooperative and tamper resistant way using a distributed ledger, and so. That, that's really kind of the, the trade-off involved in, in going down decentralized routes. Um, but for some use cases, like you know, individual enterprise use cases and things like that, um, using a, a centralized, like literally a database for your DIDs would be perfectly practical. Um, and and we, we wouldn't discourage it. Um, the, the only issue becomes when you want to open that up uh, and allow um, use cases to, to bleed over from, um, from one into the other. Um, and then you really want something that, that can be uh, open and, and suitable for everyone. Um, Let's see, we've got a couple of other ones. A couple um, of questions on steward incentives, actually. Yeah, what, um, yeah. Uh, okay. um, Dave and one from uh, Nilesh. Um, maybe I'll just cover that quickly, James. Uh, we did have another use case to share as well, which we could probably do, but let's, have, let's do the questions first, because that's what people are interested in, obviously. Um, uh, so what drives the stewards to be part of the sovereign foundation other than to increase the trust in the mainnet itself? So that is a good question. So um, a steward is an organization that volunteers to run a node on the sovereign ledger. Um, that could be a node on mainnet or on the staging net. Um, why do they do it? Well, um, a couple of reasons really. One is they believe in this whole concept and they want to be a part of it. And the second is that they may be wanting to launch services themselves um, that use this technology and being able to say they are a steward of the network and they participate in running the network um, is a big kind of benefit for them from a trust perspective. Um, you know, they are part of the, the team of, of stewards who, you know, globally who are making this thing work. Um, so th th those are the primary incentives there uh, that we found with stewards, you know, huge, big organizations and small little startups um, around the world that are making this thing work and making it possible. Yeah, but it's, it's worth noting that it's not required to be a steward um, to, to participate in this ecosystem. Correct. So there's, there are less than 100 stewards, um, uh, but there are many hundreds of uh, companies building on, on Hyperledger area and Hyperledger indie based solutions. Um, so yeah. it's a bit like the internet, isn't it? You don't have to run a DNS to use the internet, but we're really happy some people do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
let's see uh, other questions uh yeah so there was a question for more details about IATA so yeah you can check the webinar link that Andy posted you can also just google for IATA travel pass and you'll see in, in IATA's own words um the uh, the details of that um that's it I think so far is it okay well I mean gosh I, I think if we if we do the next use case we're going to go way over maybe it makes sense to um uh, just to see if there's any any final questions, or do you want to take take five minutes on the next use case, Andy? What, what would you like? Um, um, if if you have time, uh, we could just do a follow up on uh, say Monday the twenty second, so next Monday, and just uh, do a session specifically on the uh, on the covered credential stuff. Um, I think, um, Martin, why don't we just do like a couple of minutes? Um, sure on this other use case. And then I want to just, mm -hmm. James, you'll see I've just dropped in slides 19 to 21 as well. So we could cover that off in a second. Um, just a really, really high mm -hmm. level. Um, okay. In fact, let's let's just hit slide 19 first, actually, could we, James? Because um, we can then drop back into this use case. So we'll, this is a, a kind of really high level um, uh, oh. way to understand why people like IATA and others uh, are looking so deeply at this technology. Um, yeah, you're gonna have to de-share and reshare on you otherwise yeah, you won't come. It's, um, <laughs> being, it's being tricky. Uh, here we go, present. Um, and this, what I'm gonna show you just applies across any type of ecosystem, um, uh, anywhere that you, you, know, you might want to um, uh, share data in a, in a new way. Yeah, is that the one you wanted? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Um, so I mean, this is a bit bank specific, but it doesn't matter. But if, imagine um, a large global bank with many departments, many organization, uh, organizations within it. Often for regulatory reasons, they can't talk to each other, right? Um, or they may be allowed to talk to each other. But if you just hit the next slide, James, um, what they have to do to make that work is they have to create loads and loads of spaghetti behind the scenes. Um, uh, millions of APIs, you know, uh, large tech companies and system integrators make huge amounts of money from doing exactly this, right? It's very, very complicated. And I've been the victim of uh, a number of these projects in my corporate past, and it's horrendously painful, and they generally fail. Um, what's, what they're trying to do is get data from one part of their operation to another. Um, so in this new world of SSI, if you just go to the next slide, James, right? Think of it this way, right? The customer is the API. You give the customer the data because that data can be verified as authentic. Um, the customer can move that data from one part of the business to another part or from one silo to another silo. And the recipient silo can verify the authenticity of that data straight away. So the customer becomes the API, right? The customer, the user, the holder. They, they take the data and they move it between the silos for you, which is, is epic. If you think of it from an efficiency perspective, it's absolutely fantastic. So um, think of it like that, all right? That's, in the IRT use case, all of the silos are the airlines and the airports and the test labs. And to try and knit them all together would be really, really, really complicated. By giving the passenger the data, the passenger can move the data around the silos for you. And it saves a huge problem with APIs and uh, uh, integration behind the scenes. So that's, to, to, if you can, you can take this concept and put it into any use case you want. Um, so just do another minute on the employee uh, mobility use case. Uh, if we just hit that one, James, slide. Yeah, which, yeah. Uh, oh, you've got to go up and down, haven't you? That's okay. Um, yeah. yeah, that one there. So um, imagine, uh, if you will, a massive um, healthcare provider in the UK that happens to be the world's fifth largest employer with 1.3 million staff, composed of 230 fairly siloed um, hospitals um, where employees, because of the COVID situation, have to move around an awful lot between these different hospitals. Um, so the, the use case here is to give the employee digital credentials about their employee identity, their qualifications, uh, their hire, you know, where they are in the hierarchy, who their line manager is, who their employing organization is, and so on. So that when the employee moves from uh, their, their base hospital to 
um, a destination hospital where they have to go and you know, respond to some COVID emergency, they're able to onboard and prove who they are, um, their qualifications, and crucially also who they are employed by so that money can change hands, right? Because the destination hospital has to pay the originating hospital for this person. Um, they can onboard and prove all that in a matter of seconds, as opposed to 24 to 48 hours checking paperwork, making phone calls, faxing stuff. Um, so a huge opportunity there and uh, one that's rolling out at the moment. Um, under the skin, it's the same problem being solved. How do you get verifiable data from A to B? And here they're giving it to the employees who carry it and move it and it can be verified. Same approach as for IATA where it's given to a traveler and they can carry it and move it and get it verified. Um, so just think of that sort of cross silo integration challenge as one of the main things being solved here without damaging the privacy and security of the holder. Yeah, and, and I think it's worth noting that in, in this case, um, one of the reasons they, they wanted an open source and, and standards based approach um, is because of their size and scale. And as you mentioned, you know, they're a truly vast organization. Um, you know, so they're, they're thinking of this less as placing a bet on a tiny company like Evernim um, and more of, um, you know, investing in an approach where uh, actually Evernim and a constellation of other vendors um, will be able to, to, to bring to bear their respective talents and solve this problem for the whole enterprise. Um, and in many ways, that's the first time this kind of thing has been possible. Like in, in the old world, you would have to just sign a big contract with uh, a big a big vendor. And you know, for projects of this size, there'd be a very small, you know, probably a single digit um, length list of, of vendors who would be candidates. Um, and that's going to be expensive and leave you locked in for, for probably at least a decade. Um, and so, you know, by by basing this on uh, trust over IP principles and the Hyperledger Aries framework, um, we've given this uh, this organization the confidence to embark on what is a quite a bold uh, digital transformation um, agenda. Um, so that's that's really, really cool. Um, and, you know, what's been cool is, in addition, is seeing this pattern repeat itself across other enterprises that share this same uh, the same pattern of symptoms because you know from the outside all of us think of companies as monoliths right but anyone who's worked inside a big one knows that it that they're all similar in that they have different uh, different departments different jurisdictions different IT systems different um, uh, different uh, policies um, and add to that the fact that not every employee is a full-time employee um, add to the fact that partners need access to certain systems and the old, the old way of doing things, the idea that, well, you just, you know, what we need is a single source of truth, um, just build a bigger database, um, that reaches breaking point really quickly um, in these scenarios. And so we've seen um, this same pattern play out with um, large global uh, technology service providers um, we have as a customer. Um, and also there's a couple of other regulated entities outside of the healthcare space um, who have the same family of use cases, i.e. staff moving around, lots of locations, really strict regulatory requirements about knowing who those staff are. Um, and this approach um, works really, really well there in a way that the, the traditional approaches might not. So it's been really cool. But actually, since we've got, um, since, since we've got, I don't know, I, I've got probably another five, five or six minutes I'm able to stay on. I'm actually really interested. We've got 26 folks still on the call. I'm, I'm desperate to hear what other people are working on, actually. Um, so if anyone feels like sharing some of uh, some of how their projects are working and, and where they found benefits. And, and in particular, if you've had experiences which are different from ours, um, uh, I, would, I would really love to hear that. Yeah, I need to um, <clears throat> jump for another call, unfortunately, James, but if you're okay to hang on. Um, I, I'm really keen to hear as well. Maybe uh, you can let me you're know. You recorded, Andy, so you can catch up on the last five minutes. That's, that's no worries. Thanks for being my wingman. Yeah. Oh, there we go. There's one from Paul. Oh, nice. Right. Um, Lovely to talk to you. Good to see some um, familiar names out there as well. And uh, you know, good luck, everyone, with everything you're doing. I'll leave you in James's capable hands. Cool. Cheers, Andy. Um, Paul, that sounds really interesting. Can you can you unpack that a bit for us? Would you mind coming off mute and just give us give us a few seconds to explain? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> my background is in telecommunications and uh, authentication in a very, very, very old uh, network infrastructure is really easy to defraud. Um, particularly in countries that are probably more susceptible to um, uh, corruption uh, than others, so more likely non-first world countries. 
Uh, they all connect globally, so abuse for that. I don't know if you have much of it in the UK, but in Australia it's prevalent, mm. uh, is the ability to spoof um, really critical infrastructure. So being able to uh, allow an individual, particularly for um, phone numbers, which can roam globally, uh, to assign that as a credential. Uh, and as long as the, the owner, uh, which is the issuer, which is typically the uh, communications authority for the government at the time, I'm not sure who it is in the UK, but it's uh, the AC Main Australia. Mm -hmm. They own the uh, number databases and then uh, they allow carriers to actually leverage that associated with a plan. So it's really the individual's uh, identity at the end of the day. So being able to retain that identity and move between carriers as you port numbers, yeah. it should be a credential. It shouldn't be uh, sitting somewhere else. So it helps, helps uh, with, I guess, identifying that, you know, the person's calling you is actually that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is a super interesting use case. So how, how far along is that project, if, if you're able to say? Is that, is that a concept phase? Or is yeah. that Very early days. So I'm probably going to have to reach out to you guys to uh, have a bit of a chat about uh, your wallets and, and how we can leverage that on a different infrastructure platform. But, yeah, very, very early days. Well, su super exciting. In, in, my, uh, in my past life, I, I worked with a company that was um, using the phone number as a, a second factor authentication on, on behalf of a number of the large large internet providers, um, and uh, so we um, we were involved in in that very battle that you're describing. You know, the, the arms race against people um, spoofing numbers, porting them off, um, impersonating, and things like that. So I'm, I'm painfully aware of the challenge. Um, so that sounds like a really cool solution. Cool, thanks. Great. Uh, anybody else in the last couple of minutes want to speak up about their project? And you know, who knows? Maybe you'll find some collaborators on the call. No. Okay. I don't oh, see. Yeah. That's seems it. seems like everybody's uh, a bit uh, overwhelmed. Or, um, yeah. I mean, this session was incredible, and I do wish that we will have we would have more time, and hopefully we can uh, schedule some time to talk a bit more about uh, the last uh, last use case you shared with us. Um, Thank you so much for participating, everyone, and for a great discussion. Uh, I really appreciate it. James, of course, you know, you guys did an incredible job uh, with, um, with presenting, with facilitating the discussion and everything else. The sheer fact that we ran over uh, that much shows that everybody was really excited and interested. Um, and yeah, uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention to everyone is that we have two Coming, sessions coming up. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, will be ha uh, handled, delivered by Digital Assets. Again, the same concept, very interactive, very full of questions uh, on the UTXO and account models. Uh, and then uh, in, on March 17th, Consensus will continue with the Ethereum and Hyperledger series. Uh, this time, it will be tech demos and uh, AMA session on Hyperledger BESU and interactions between Hyperledger community and uh, Ethereum community. And with that, thank you so much for participating. Everyone safe, stay, stay, stay safe, and I'll talk to you very soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much for the session. Bye-bye.